Hello, welcome. This is the History of Ancient Greek Philosophy, and I'm Mark Dorsby. In this video lecture, we'll be looking at some of the later pre-Socratic philosophers. In particular, we'll be looking at the Atomist, and then we'll also be taking a look at some of the Sophist. Um, in the next video after this, we'll start taking a look at Socrates um, proper. Uh, so, welcome everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, what I want to do in this video is really sort of give you an overview of some of the other pre-Socratic philosophers as well as some of the sophist. Um, and at this point, the, the majority of the philosophers we're looking at right now actually lived and were, roughly speaking, contemporaries of Socrates. But they generally fit within either the pre-Socratic um, physiological philosophies um, that began with Thales um, in Miletus, or um, they refer to the Soph we'll be talking about the Sophist, who didn't conceive of themselves as philosophers, but were very much interested in the same sorts of questions that philosophers engage with. So, welcome to the class, and I think you're going to enjoy um, today's session. So, the first sort of philosophers we're going to take a look at are the fifth century atomist. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about atomistic theory. Now, atomism really comes from Leucippus and Democritus. Um, and what is atomism? Atomism is essentially a mechanistic explanation of reality. Uh, the word atom literally means no cut in, Greece, in Greek. Um, and the idea is not unlike our own modern atomistic theory, which is namely that reality, um, despite its appearances, is actually composed of very small little things that can't be broken apart. Now it's important to recognize here that the atomism that Democritus here proposes is not the same theory that we adhere to in the modern world um, in Newtonian physics um, where we talk about atoms and hydrogen, oxygen, and you know all of these uh, uh, how the different elements on the periodic table or ultimately have an atomic weight and they're composed of specific sorts of atoms that move in certain ways. Um, this is not exactly the same theory um, that the Leucippus and Democritus proposed, but we'll see that certainly the notion of atomism really begins with these, these two thinkers. Um, part of the problem here is that modern atomistic theory um, is one in which atoms can be split apart and can be broken down. So, um, unfortunately, you might say that um, the atomistic theory that atoms are um, irreducible and indivisible, this part of the ancient pre-Socratic theory has been, is not the case. Um, unless, of course, we find something someday um, where we do find things that are irreducible and indivisible. And by the way, it's interesting because there's actually a debate about this in contemporary physics, and I think many physicists, including Stephen Hawking, argue that at root, at bottom, there has to be um, some basic stuff that can't be broken apart. Uh, but this is still an ongoing question in modern physics, um, so it's very interesting. So, But it's important to recognize here that atomism is a mechanistic explanation of reality, and we can contrast this with the sort of of explanations that either Heraclitus gives, Parmenides gives, or you could even say that, for instance, the sorts of explanations that um, Anaximander gives. All of their, all these other pre-Socratics give structural explanations. They say what things are made of, generally speaking. Thales says things are made of water. Um, they sort of identify elements and then try to maintain how everything is made up of those elements through some sort of of mechanistic um, interaction. So uh, we'll see later today, for instance, the idea that, that um, maybe things are made of air and air can be condensed and rarefied. Um, but with Democritus and Leucippus here, we get a much more um, sense here where the motion of these indivisible particles is as important as the particles themselves for explaining reality. So you'll see this as we sort of go through the material. So let me give you a little bit of uh, information on the biography of these two philosophers. The first is Leucippus, and we have basically all, know almost nothing of him. Um, the only thing we know about him primarily is um, references that Democritus made to him um, and that some other later philosophers discuss him. Epicurus, who actually lived around, um, around 
a little bit after Aristotle here. Um, Epicurus actually denied that Leucippus ever existed. Now, what's interesting there is that Epicurus is also an atomist. I um, mean, he agrees fundamentally with Democritus, but he didn't actually think that Leucippus existed. Um, and, but we do today generally recognize Leucippus as having existed, and we believe that he probably proposed atomism sometime around 440 to 430 BCE. Um, so we think that's probably, roughly speaking, the time in which he probably proposed the theory. But again, we don't have any solid information. Democritus, we do know existed. Um, we're confident of that, for sure. Um, but and we and Democritus, you know, he, we believe that he was a student of Leucippus, and he was a contemporary of Socrates, Plato, and in fact the young Aristotle. Um, so again, here these pre-Socratic philosophers are not so much pre-Socrates in terms of time, but really pre in terms of uh, the development um, within uh, philosophy itself. Um, Democritus is supposed to have been a prolific writer, having written nearly 70 titles, or at least the ancient, um, ancient sources tell us that there was roughly 70 titles. Basically, none of it survives today, unfortunately. There's very few um, direct passages on atomism by Democritus. Um, in fact, most of what we know um, about Democritus and about these early atomists comes from really um, people who are criticizing the atomist. Um, a lot of it comes from Aristotle's discussion of atomism, but we'll see that the sources are varied. Um, sources include um, a whole range of thinkers, and I've tried as best I can to note them. Again, take a look at the textbook that we're using, um, which, which identifies all of the sources. Um, in their specificity. So let's sort of start and begin by just talking about what the atoms are. And here's sort of these, uh, so the ancient Greeks generally thought of the atoms as being like circles, like spheres. Um, and here's an example in which you have atoms uh, entangling together to create something else. So uh, what we can say is that Democritus seems to have held that the atoms are infinite in number, so there's a lot of them. Uh, they're indivisible. Um, so they can't be broken apart. That's why a sphere probably is the best representation of what these atoms look like. This isn't a very good representation because it looks split. They're indivisible. They can't be divided. Um, notably, Democritus, probably separate from Leucippus, held that the atoms were infinitesimal. That is, they were tiny, uh, which would help to explain a lot of different things. But even though that they were infinitesimal or small, they, they believed that there were different types of atoms and that some of they varied in size and shape. The key feature being that they were indivisible. Uh, they could be broken down. And importantly, the atoms are in motion. So uh, the atoms are in a sort of fluidic state in which they're moving. Now, we'll see, though, that they held that the atoms did not move on their own accord. So there's no principle of motion for these atoms, but rather they move because... They've, uh, they've been sort of pushed by something else. Um, the, a lot of the, the fragments um, from Democritus suggest that he, he, he often describes their motion in terms of blowing, like thing, like dust blowing in the wind. Um, and maybe that's a good sort of example to imagine what he may have thought. Um, so for instance, when you sit um, in front of a window when it's sunny and you can see dust particles and you can blow and it pushes them around, this is a sort of uh, visual phenomenal imagery of probably the sense of the theory that they have here. Um, but of course, the idea here is that all of the things that we see in reality, like our bodies, um, coffee cups, rocks, everything in our perception is ultimately composed of these tiny little things that clump together in different forms. The language of the way, the language of how these atoms interact is uh, usually referred to as a form of entanglement. And that's the term I'll be using. Now, of course, atoms, if they're going to exist, they have to exist in something. Um, and they exist in the void. So you can see here we talked earlier about the conception of the void uh, by um, er an earlier pre-Socratic philosopher. And we see this concept of the void coming again. Now, in, in the pre in the um, fragments associated with Democritus and Leucippus, 
the atoms are referred to as what is, and the void is referred to as what is not, right? And the idea here is that you have all of these atoms, but these atoms, if they're going to move, they have to move in something. But if all things that exist are made of atoms, then whatever it is they're moving in has to be nothing. It can't be a something as such. Um, of course, this raises a whole range of questions for us. Um, um, in a video previous to this, we looked at Parmenides. And Parmenides argued that what is, is, and what is not, is not. And the idea there was that if something is not, if something is nothing, then it can't exist. And if it can't exist, then it makes no sense to talk about it as existing. And this represents a significant challenge, actually, for Leucippus and Democritus, I believe, because unlike Parmenides, they argued that the void was real, that there really was such a thing as nothing, um, and they called it the void here. And that sort of raises a whole range of questions of what, what we mean. We might say that they, these, the, the atomist argued a sort of dualistic metaphysics in which the atoms, what is, um, are subsidiary in relation to what is not, and that both of which have some sort of reality. Um, it's unclear what that reality would consist in. Now notice here that even though I'm talking about this with regard to the pre-Socratic philosophers, we might as easily make the same criticism against modern atomistic theory as well. Um, if you've taken physics, you'll know that atoms, uh, a sort of image we have of atoms, is that at the core of an atom, right, is the neutron, and around the neutron uh, orbit these electrons, and inside of there are the protons. And I'm not a physicist, and I'll leave the physics to you to study. Um, but what is important is that in modern atomic physics, we hold that atoms are principally made up of nothing. That is, most of their mainly empty space, right? The electrons orbit and then in between their orbit is nothing. Um, and so that raises a whole range of questions. Well, what exactly is nothing in modern atomic physics? Now, physicists will have probably better grasp of, of this distinction than I can probably make in this video with reference to these ancient pre-Socratic philosophers. But I think that some of the same uh, intellectual difficulties that the pre-Socratic philosophers of um, Democritus and Leucippus um, had, their difficulties, I think, are still with us today. Um, the void is where the atoms are not, and this allows for the motion of the atoms. Um, so the void is a really important principle concept. Critical here is to recognize that atomism is a materially mechanistic theory, right? And so this notion is that as these atoms collide, they get entangled with each other, and then over time, this develops into the sorts of substances that we can recognize in our visual and uh, perception, as well as the other organs of perception we have. Now, what's important to recognize here is that in the ancient world, the, this mechanistic theory is to be contrasted to the teleological theory of Plato and Aristotle. Now, we haven't covered Plato and Aristotle yet, so we'll be talking about teleology in later videos. But you might say, just speaking real quickly and sort of off the cuff here, teleology comes from the root root telos, or telos. And a telos refers to the purpose towards which something aims. And so what you might say here is that these earlier, I'm sorry, that Plato and Aristotle, especially Aristotle here, he, he argues that physics, things move in accordance with their purpose, um, and that there is a purpose for things. Um, this, the, the atomists don't think this. They don't think that things have a, a necessary purpose. Rather, they think that everything exists out of the necessary deterministic movement of these atoms. Um, there's no purpose to why... Um, uh, you know, why the bird flies the way it does. Rather, it just simply does as a contingent consequence of the necessity of atomistic motion. Um, I hope that makes sense. Now, Aristotle actually, we get a lot of information about these early atomists from Aristotle, but he criticized them for not explaining the source of motion. In the later videos, we'll look at the, his notion, Aristotle's notion of the unmoved mover, and we'll see that Aristotle suggests um, a theory, he suggests a holistic, systematic account of the physical cosmos, 
Um, and at the very center of it is his conception of the unmoved mover, or God, though, though we have to be careful about the language of God when we talk about the unmoved mover. Um, so Aristotle has a purpose-driven physics, and um, he thinks he can explain the source of motion. The atomists, by contrast, don't tell us why things are moving. They just tell us that they are, um, and that that motion can explain mechanistically the sorts of substances that we perceive in the phenomenal world. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so let's go take a look here. What I have here is I want to sort of go through some of the key ideas of these early atomistic theories. And I've given, in some cases, um, brief quotations um, from, the, from the text we've been using. Uh, but I've tried to give at least the author's name of where you can find this stuff. Um, the first thing here is determinism, right? So one of the fragments associated with Democritus is that, quote, no things happen at random, but all things uh, happen as a result of a reason and by necessity. So this is, they didn't use the language of determinism, but it would be quite important for later philosophers, right? The notion here is that everything moves by necessity. Everything is occurring and exist because they, they have to, uh, because of the laws of motion and things that get entangled in certain ways, and there's no way around it. So consequently, this is a sort of first form of deterministic theory in which you can say, for instance, that uh, there is no such thing as freedom. Um, freedom would have to just be an illusion or uh, a sort of, uh, yeah, it'd have to be an illusion created um, by not understanding the atomistic necessity of things. Now, uh, this, of course, leads us right into the modern world where we have an atomic physics theory. And in fact, most physicists are probably determinist as well. That is, we generally believe that there are certain laws of the universe. Big Bang happened. Things are moving and colliding with each other, atoms and particles, etc., etc. And that based upon the laws that govern motion, Everything is happening consequentially, one, two, three, four. Everything is happening deterministically. So you can see here that our own deterministic, our own physics is deterministic, and it follows closely in line with, I think, the determinism of Democritus as well. The key, the next key point here to recognize is the concept of entanglement. Entanglement here refers to, I think, the general category of relation that the atoms have with each other, right? So Diogenes here quotes, or at least references Democritus when he uh, writes that all things, according to Democritus, are unlimited, right? Remember I said that they're infinite, and they turn around one another that all is both the empty and the full. The empty is the language of the void. The full is the language of what is or that's the language of the atoms. And the worlds come to be when the atoms fall into the void and are entangled with each other. So this is a cosmological theory, right? much like our own atomistic theory. right? And here's another a quotation uh, that uh, Simplicius quotes from Aristotle talking about Democritus. And that's, quote, as the atoms strike one another and become entangled in a way that makes them be in contact and close to one another, but does not make anything out of them that truly is one. So that's a sort of important point, that as they strike each other and they get sort of stuck to each other, these atoms, they, they create what look like substances. So for instance, you can look at me or look at, any, look at the computer before you, and it looks like a single unitary substance. But this notion that it's one thing is an illusion. Really, it's a composition of a whole bunch of tiny little things together. Um, and it's easy for us to accept this explanation because most of us today are trained in modern physics, or at least we have some education in it. And by consequence, this seems very sort of plausible to us. But I want you to recognize here that this was not entirely obvious, nor was it entirely plausible to all of the thinkers like Aristotle and Plato who looked at it. The key here, and you continuing on with our discussion of the previous pre-Socratic philosophers, we can say that the atoms are the first principles, right? They are, um, they are the at bottom the 
the primary explanation for what we're experiencing in our reality. They're infinite and infinitesimal, but as I mentioned before, that he sees uh, Democrats believe that the nature of eternal things is that they're small substances, right? And probably most importantly, what we see with the atomist, and this is something that Aristotle comments on, is we see a single systematic theory being articulated. So, for instance, when we read Heraclitus, clearly there was no systematic theory. Uh, it's very difficult to know if there was one. And even if we go and we look at, for instance, the theories of Thales or Anaxagmander, right, we don't see a systematic evaluation, one single um, set one single theory that can try to explain everything and we do see this with the atomist so I think the atomists really reveal a progress in the development of ancient uh, philosophical thought um, so uh, or at least the early first versions of a sort of systematic interrogation of the world now for Democritus um, importantly, only the intelligible things are true or real. And this is something that Sextus Empiricus quotes, but it's actually something that Plato and Aristotle will ultimately agree with as well, is that what is real and what is true has to be intelligible. So these early atomists, they're committed to the idea that it is possible for us to have knowledge. We'll see, for instance, when we look at later on, when we look at the Sophists, particularly Gorgias, we'll see that there, you don't have to necessarily be committed to the idea that reality is intelligible. Uh, but here we do see this insight or this, this view is that reality is actually intelligible. And I should state here that this is something that I think is still debatable today. For instance, even though we have modern physics and we have um, quantum mechanics and we have a whole range of theories that give us really an uh, incredible grasp on explaining the nature of things, it still remains to be, be seen, I think, or proven whether or not um, reality, apart from our perception, is something that's intelligible by our perception. For instance, uh, you'll recall that when we looked at um, 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 Xenophanes, right, he argued, he talked about the idea that if, if horses could draw pictures of their gods, they would draw them like horses. And the, he said that the Ethiopians draw pictures of their gods as snub nose like themselves. And there's this sort of recognition that the, the language with which we use to understand our reality is principally a language that um, is dependent upon the, the forms of sensation and the categories of language that, that we're capable of. And it seems a little bit... Um, it seems like hubris to to think that reality, apart from our perception, is intelligible always by our perception. So whether or not reality is intelligible is always intelligible by us, or rather I could, should say this, is that whatever is intelligible has to be real, and by contrast, whatever is real has to be intelligible, that sort of um, biconditional or material equivalence whether or not we want to maintain that, I don't know, it seems to me a little bit hubris. It seems to me a, a, to be a form of hubris. It also seems to me likely that there could be many things that are real, that are utterly unintelligible for human beings. Um, and so that's an interesting question we can, we can think of, and I, and I hope that you're going to be thinking about this, because as we go through this course, and we'll see that philosophy really is about what is intelligible. Um, because of the law of non-contradiction and so forth, but um, the set, there's a secondary question whether or not what is intelligible ultimately gets us, that is, outside of our own perception and into reality. This is a, a, a tension we're going to see a little bit later today as we look at the sophist. Now, what are some of the properties of atoms? Well, for Democritus, the two primary properties were size and shape, but notably Epicurus, who we will cover in a later lecture, really at the end of the course here. Um, Epicurus, in his atomism, he adopts Democritus, but he adds a, a third property, and that being the property of weight. Right, um, And, of course, atomism seeks to explain phenomena. Um, which is an important distinction, is that the or an important uh, thing to recognize here is that the atomists want to understand 
the reality we're experiencing. One of the problems we have well, that I seem to, one of the criticisms I have of Parmenides, for instance, is that when Parmenides says that all things are one, uh, that doesn't really explain phenomenal reality at all. It doesn't explain what I'm experiencing. It merely suggests that what I'm experiencing is false. Um, the atomists give me an explanation uh, that actually can explain those phenomena. Now, I'm not sure that they're that atomism is entirely intelligible, particularly because of this problem of the void. What is the void if it's nothing? I'm not sure what that means. Um, and so there's an, there may be an intelligibility problem with atomism, but there certainly is an attempt to make our phenomena intelligible. Aristotle also tells us that Democritus in particular was open to argumentation. And so I think it's important to recognize that the atomists are philosophers in the sense that it seems that they were willing to change their views based upon arguments that are given. Um, so, uh, so they're not, it's not just a matter of persuasion like we'll see in the sophists, but, the, but the, and again, that goes closely with intelligibility because intelligibility seems to be made manifest through argumentation and through analysis. Now, motion is the result of the void. Um, atoms don't move on their own, as I said earlier. Now, how do the atoms move? Well, we're told, according to Atias here, that Democritus held that there's one kind of motion, um, and that's due to pulsation. Now, what exactly pulsation is, of course, we're familiar with what a pulse is, right? A pulse is something that's um, repetitively pushing. So you might say that when... Democritus talks about the atoms blowing around, that they're blowing around according to some sort of pulsation. Uh, but of course, the question that Aristotle asks is, well, what is the origin of this pulse? Um, and we're never, we don't know. At least Aristotle's comment, commentary suggests that Democritus and Lucippus never answered this question, at least not to his satisfaction. Um, they do move by necessity, not purpose, not teleology. Um, Aristotle makes that own difference. Of course, when Demi whenever you have to be careful because in all of the fragments here, whenever Aristotle is talking about Democritus, he's ultimately talking about Democritus and the atomist with an eye of criticism or uh, with, a, with a note of criticism here because he has a different theory, a teleological theory he's suggesting. Now, a good, I wanted to give you this. Uh, this quotation comes from Theophrastus, who actually took over Aristotle's school after his um, exile and death, right? Uh, but he has sort of an example of how the atoms are moving and what they're creating, right? And also an example of how atomism seeks to explain phenomena, right? He, iron is harder and lead is heavier since iron has its atoms arranged unevenly and has large quantities of void in many places. Now, it's hard to, to really believe that these early atomists had experimental evidence for these sorts of claims, but this is probably this is probably descriptive evidence. To a certain degree, iron and lead, if you compare them by describing their properties, you might suggest that because they weigh differently, there's more void in one than there is the other. Uh, but you can see here you have the early workings of a materialistic theory. Um, and you can see here the explanatory power of phenomena. Of course, the universe is infinite, we're, we're told by Diogenes Laertius here, uh, that the atomists believe that the universe was infinite. So the, and this makes sense, right? So they believe both that the void is infinite, and they also believe that the atoms are infinite, which we don't, at least I don't know exactly why, probably because none of the work survive, but it makes sense. If you're going to have an infinite number of atoms, well, you need an infinite size void in order for them to, to move around. Um, so you have a dualistic infinitude, which is sort of interesting and also complicated. What does that mean exactly? How can we imagine that? Now, modern mathematical set theory actually gives us the mechanics for understanding how it's possible potentially for there to be two four, two things of infinitude at the same time. So it's not unintelligible, um, but it's not easily intelligible, I would say. Um, I, I love this quote, and I wanted to throw it in here from Democritus, which is Democritus says, quote, and this comes from Sextus Empiricus, who's a, a skeptic, um, much later, he's a Roman doctor and skeptic. Um, but Democritus also has, is quoted as having said, in reality, we know nothing about anything for each person 
opinion is a reshaping of the soul's atoms by the atoms entering from without. And I think this is a sort of fabulous um, application of atomistic theory where you see that Democritus is beginning to apply his own theory to his own epistemology about the theory. Um, and that's the idea that what is an opinion, right? If everything is made of atoms and moving around, then you might say that an opinion is merely an, a consequence of a certain arrangement of atoms in my mind, in my soul. And they, they use the language of soul atoms. Um, and there's some there's some um, some reason to suggest that there's a differentiation of atoms um, in the soul versus atoms in immater immaterial objects because the soul is again this thing that somehow is a principle of well they would never say it's a principle of motion but the soul seems to have a different sort of arrangement now but my knowledge is my knowledge according to Democritus is based upon the arrangement of the atoms in my soul um, when atoms outside interact with my soul atoms, my opinions change. Because of this, all knowledge, quote-unquote knowledge, has to be based upon opinion. Um, or all knowledge is just contingent upon the atomic structure of the soul or something like this. Um, and so by consequence, you'd have to say that we can never really know what the world is in and of itself. Because we are ourselves atoms. So you have this interesting perspectival um, admission here in Democritus, uh, which raises, of course, uh, opens the door for epistemological skepticism. Okay, so that is in brief Democritus and uh, Leucippus here on um, atomism. And this, and, the, and it's, of course, we have to recognize and that. The atomism of the Greek world is not identical to the atomism of the modern period, but certainly the suggestion of modern atomic physics has its conceptual genealogical lineage to these ancient pre-Socratic philosophers. Okay, so there's another pre-Socratic philosopher I want to mention who's not an um, atomist, uh, but that's Diogenes of Apollonia. Now, he, this philosopher is the last of the Fusilogoi, um, and that means the philosophers who seek an explanation through physical means. So you might say the Diogenes here, and remember, I should be clear, there's different Diogenes. So whenever you see Diogenes, you have to be clear there's different, there's a whole bunch of different Diogeneses, um, or different persons named Diogenes in ancient Greek history. Um, in ancient Greek philosophy. So this is one particular Diogenes. Uh, but this Diogenes, he's really the last of these early material physicists, uh, early material pre-Socratic philosophers or physicists um, that we see in line with, Mali with uh, the philosophers who came from Miletus. Now, and that's interesting, it's not it's not a surprise here because Apollonia was actually a colony of Miletus. So Miletus was a, col a Greek colony and then Apollonia was a colony established by the Miletians. We believe that Diogenes was active, that is, he was philosophically making his arguments roughly around 440 BCE. We know that he had an interest in medicine because he actually talks about the brain and he talks about how the brain must the brain is an organ that allows us to have perception of the world. Now, we should be clear here, this is nothing like neuro, uh, neurology today. because, And it's because ultimately he wrote a book on called On Nature, but his fit, first principle is that of air. Um, so just like we have um, the notion of water um, and Thales, here we have the notion of air as being the sort of first principle. So what is air? Air is the single basic stuff that everything's made of. Um, and air air changes. That means I'm physically made of air, you're made of air, and all of this sort of stuff. Now, when he says air, he's not thinking of oxygen like we think of oxygen because our conception of oxygen is atomistic. Um, so rather, air is the single basic stuff that everything's made of. The one, The answer to the one and the many, if you will, how does air change? Because when air undergoes alteration, either through condensation or rarefication, right, air changes, right? Is, and here you can see of, is we can actually today, of course, we compress air and you can get a liquid, right? So for instance, if you, if you ever have seen someone with a liquid oxygen tank, right, 
it's oxygen that's been compressed into a liquid, right? So typically we think of air as, you know, this stuff, but air can be compressed. And so the idea here is that whatever the world is made of, it's made of this stuff, air, and it gets compressed and it makes alterations in different ways. Ultimately, though, um, di um, Diogenes here argued in favor of a monism. That is, he argued in favor that everything is one. He was against metaphysical pluralism. Right? So he agrees with Parmenides to some extent that everything is air. It just has different formations. Right? Air is both also intelligent and divine. So this, this is a, a good example of where these early pre-Socratic pre philosophers, and I would even say even later philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, though perhaps with much greater um, specificity, they seem to combine intelligibility with the material principle and divinity as well. Now, uh, and I have to be careful there, Plato and Aristotle are, don't have a materialistic theory, um, but they do have a view that the there is an intelligibility to reality, and it's divinity, there is a re divinity to reality as well. Um, so the, that would mean that the cosmos, the universe, is infused with both intelligence and divinity. Uh, so here's a couple fragments here worth mentioning, right? Here's the first one. A person beginning any discourse must present a starting point that is in, indisputable and an explanation that is simple and serious. Now, I like this here, and this is a quote from Diogenes by Di a different Diogenes, so to keep things a little bit clear here. Um, but I like this point because it's an epistemological point here. These early pre-Socratic philosophers realized that in order to make arguments that are convincing, the first step of the argument has to be something that's a starting point that's indisputable. Um, and this represents a first recognition of deductive argumentation, um, though they didn't use that language. There's also a discussion here about difference in cyclicality. Right, and so here's a Simplicicus. Here he he sort of quotes Diogenes here, saying, "To sum it all up, all things that are differentiated forms of the same things and are the same thing, but all things being differentiated out of the same thing, come to be different things at different that should be times, and return into the same thing." So this idea here is that even though we experience things as being different, those quote unquote things that are different actually just sort of cyclically turn into other things and they return. So every th the universe here, the cosmos, we get a cyclical perspective. It's constantly in motion. And the difference is phenomenally real, but it's not real in reality because what is everything made up? It's actually made up of air, right? So we get this cosmology, air is the element and there are infinite there are infinite cosmoi and an infinite void. The air, by being condensed and rarefied, is generative of the cosmoi. Nothing comes to be from or perishes into what is not. So there's a denial of nothingness here. So here there's a notion of the void, but the void is not the same thing as nothing. And here we should be asking ourselves philosophically, well, what exactly does the void mean? The void is always a sort of philosophical problem. I think. The earth, but cosmologically, what's the earth? He says the earth is round and it's supported in the center, has undergone its process of formation through the rotation. Notice that the earth is rotating, they recognize that too. And it's resulting from the hot and the solidification caused by the cold, right? So there's an attempt here to take this unitary substance, air, and apply it cosmologically. Um, I think that there, I don't think that the theory ultimately is in fully intelligible as a cosmological theory, but there is the application of it, which falls in line with the other Miletian philosophers. There's also a discussion of perception I mentioned, right, where uh, Diogenes uh, links up the notion of uh, perception to the brain, and it has to do with the type of air that's in the brain, of course, right? So he says, the sense of smell is due to the air around the brain. Hearing occurs when the air in the ears is set in motion by the air outside. Sight occurs when things are reflected in the pupil, that is this pupil, um, and the reflection being mixed with the air inside produces sensation. So this is Theophrastus discussing all of, discussing um, Democritus's, uh, not Dem um, Diogenes' theory here. Um, and so this is sort of a very interesting example here um, in which you see really a sort of mashed up beginnings of science. Um, so it's quite fascinating stuff.
Okay, so those are the earlier pre-Socratics we're looking at. I want to go through the sophist here, and you're going to see here, I'm going to try to conclude this video at roughly an hour, so um, spend maybe about 15-20 uh, minutes here on the sophist. Now, the sophist, here's sort of a, a depiction of what the sophists were like, right? What, who were the sophists? Now, um, the sophists uh, really have their heyday in the 5th century BCE. Um, and, and this is also when we see a focus in both philosophy and well as in by the sophist, but really an intellectual focus in the Greek world on the moral, political, and the social. Um, so, in, so we see a sort of turning here from the, um, the earlier pre-Socratic philosophers who were really interested in the question of what the world was in terms of its material construction and organization to really with the sophist and then of course with the Socrates, we'll see that the focus really moves towards the moral, the political, and the social. Um, and of course, when we get to Plato and Aristotle, we'll see that a, a holistic um, a holistic explanation that really touches on all of it, right? Now, who are the sophists? You probably know from maybe a, a previous philosophy class that these were professional teachers and rhetoricians. And actually, there were even some sophists who were politicians in Athens. Now, what is a, a traveling, a professional teacher was namely a person, the sophists would travel from city-state to city-state to the different poli. Remember, in ancient Greece at this point, there is no uniform country. There is a uniform sort of sense of culture. So they refer to each other as Helens, right? So they're all Helens, they're all Greeks, but each Greek lived in their own city-state or polis. And the, what the Sophists would do is the Sophists would travel to all of these different poli, and they would, they for hire, they were for hire, and they would teach, um, usually the students of wealthy people, uh, you know, what was known, and that would include geometry and all this sort of stuff. But importantly, the Sophists would teach the art of rhetoric. And what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is the, is the art of... Um, making persuasive arguments, persuading people to agree to things. Um, the sophists do not have a single school, so they don't all agree with each other, What they, but they agreed in terms of the practice of their teaching. So they all taught for money, generally speaking. Um, of course, the word sophist has its root, has its same roots uh, in Greek as wisdom, like philosophers. Um, so the sophists taught a sort of wisdom. But we'll see that they weren't lovers of wisdom, not, at least that's how Plato will demarcate the sophist from Socrates and, and his own project, um, and, and Aristotle follows in, in suit. Uh, they did play, the sophist played a key part in the Greek social and intellectual life. Uh, they taught for money, and Plato and Socrates heavily criticized them for this. Um, where are the so where are our sophists? I mean, what are our sources? Where, how do we know about the sophists? There's a large amount of, of sources we have that discuss the sophists, but the largest source we have comes from Plato, um, and this represents a sort of critical problem for our interpretation of them, namely because Plato is largely critical of them. He is against the sophists for the most part, um, and he often contrasts the sophists with Socrates, the philosophes. Right, um, and so this is sort of an important distinction here, is because what the, our discussion of the sophist um, comes from sources that are largely anti-sophist. So that means that we have to recognize we probably don't have an accurate picture of the sophist, um, or we do have an accurate picture, but we just don't have a we just don't have a, an understanding of the sophist that is perhaps as intellectually honest to them as possible. Now, the most famous and the most, probably the most important of the sophists, especially from the, uh, from the uh, Platonic perspective, is Protagoras. Protagoras lived from roughly 490 BCE and died around 420. Um, and importantly, he's most famous for probably this quote, which uh, we'll see the quote that we have in our reading is slightly different here. Our, our translation is slightly different. But it, it's this notion that man is the measure of all things. And although he doesn't use this language, I think we can identify this notion as a form of epistemological relativism. Remember, epistemology refers to our theory of knowledge. And relativism here would suggest that knowledge is relative to the person who knows. 
right? Or in other words, man is the measure of all things. Um, and, we're, and this is suggested actually by a very famous Platonic dialogue called the Protagoras, in which Protagoras and um, Socrates um, get into a sort of intellectual debate. And, and if you read that dialogue, I don't think it's clear um, that, that Socrates wins the discussion. Um, and it's not, but it's also not clear that Protagoras is a completely honest player in the discussion. So he definitely represents this notion of rhetoric. But this is very famous. And if you were to say that sort of one thing that maybe the Sophists were agreed upon, it was this notion, is that knowledge is relative to the person who knows. Um, and that means knowledge is relative to our dispositions, our education, our experiences. Uh, but knowledge is not, what we call knowledge is not um, a sort of secret window into the way things really are outside of our perception. Um, because knowledge is an artifact of human engagement with the world. Now, this actually comes from, I sort of talk about teaching, since Protagoras was a teacher, right? And this quote comes from the Protagoras right at the beginning of it. Uh, where Protagoras says, my boy, if you associate with me, the result will be that the very day you begin, you will return home a better person, and the same will happen the next day. And then sort of moving forward in the passage, he says, so that why are you doing all this? So that as far as the city's affairs go, the student, that's who the he is here, the student may be the most powerful in acting and in speaking. I think this is an insightful um, uh, passage here. Why? Because the sophists seem to suggest that, that their teaching is in the art of rhetoric. And what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is about being able to persuade other people, which means that if we're to reduce down what sophistry, what the sophists were about, it was about power. Um, and in fact, this is precisely how Plato attacks the sophists in book one of the Republic, where he, um, he uses one sophist, uh, Thrasymachus, to exemplify the idea that at the bottom, everything is always comes down to uh, a form of power for the sophist, either power in action or power in speech. Um, and so you can see here, this is a this is a diametrically opposed conception of what teaching is all about from Plato. And we haven't discussed it yet in this series, but we'll see in later videos here that for Plato. Uh, teaching is about gaining knowledge through um, recollection, and that recollection is about knowing what is true, not about gaining power. Um, and so you can see here there's a different sort of sense here. So teaching is not about gaining knowledge of what is true. Teaching is about gaining uh, the knowledge of how to enact and gain power in your action, in your in your speech over others. So I think this is a, an interesting way in which we can sort of divide up or contrast philosophy from sophistry. Sophistry is about power. Philosophy is about truth. Now, I think we have to also be open to the possibility that maybe philosophy, as I've contrasted it just now, is a bankrupt project. Maybe when it comes down to it, all we have is this, right? Um, and so what is teaching? Teaching isn't about gaining knowledge or insight into things. It's about training. It's about training. And so art or techne without practice and practice without art or nothing, right? So at root, you might say that um, power is a form of techne. And we're going to see this term come up again and again. Uh, and there's different transliterations of it. This is uh, one transliteration. Uh, we'll see others later on. So here's a couple quotes that I wanted to take you through that are related to Protagoras. From Sextus Empiricus, we get this idea that a person is the measure of all things, of things that are, that they, of things that are, that they are, of things that are not, that they are not. Um, and so you can see here, we get, when we talk about man is the measure of all things, this is a better quotation here, because we can say that, we can see here that when Protagoras says that a person is the measure of all things. They have the, they're epistemologically the determining factor for what we say is known and what's not. We can say here that the measurement of things consists in affirmation of what is or denial of what is not. Um, so this is sort of very important. It's sort of the basic roots. We either affirm what is or we affirm what is not. Uh, or that is we deny what is not or we deny what is. 
right? That's the form of our measurement. Um, Protagoras was the first to use his known Diogenes Laertius here says that uh, Protagoras was the first to use dialect in argument and he attempted to prove that contradiction was impossible. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute later. Protagoras was the first to declare that there are two mutually opposed arguments on any subject. Right, so whenever we discuss so the idea here is whatever claim there is, there's always two potential arguments. And you can see this makes sense from a rhetorician or a debater's perspective. Um, but also logically, right? Every time there's a claim, right, we, uh, it seems that we can provide arguments one way or another. Uh, now, though, um, Stephanus of Byzantium here, and along with other people like Plato here, suggest that Protagoras was a sort of dirty player in the sense that he could make the weaker argument stronger, and he taught his students to blame and praise the same person. You can see here that blaming and praising the same person is sort of contradictory. How can you both blame and praise simultaneously? And so you can see here that, uh, well, Protagoras probably said that since contradiction is impossible, you, this isn't, it's not a contradiction is what he would suggest. Uh, but you can see here that he was criticized by later philosophers um, is really, you know, making ar some arguments sound good that weren't. Uh, and, and being so good at debate that um, you could provide a weak argument and yet convince people. Um, and maybe that attests to his, his uh, the strength of his, his sophistic teachings. Now, this is not what I want in our text. This is, our text is, when in our, in our text, when we're reading about Protagoras is when we get the Disoi Logoi. It's important to note that this is not attributed to Protagoras. This text is actually considered the oldest text on logic, though the author is unknown. Um, but the reason I think our book mentions it is because it seems to resonate with a lot of what Protagoras argued in terms of contradiction. Now, the Disoi Logoi is the oldest text on logic that's known. All it is is a fragment. We don't know... Um, it's in stone, <laughs> literally. We don't know who wrote it, but we do believe that this is the first recognition and discussion of contradiction that there was. I've included really sort of the gist of it here, and I'll read through it briefly. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, but I do think it's important because uh, it, it demonstrates um, the, the first discussion in logic, right? So twofold arguments are also stated concerning the false and the true. So we see a distinction of bivalence here um, in the Disoi Logoi, of which one declares that true logos, and remember logos just means speech, and false logos are different from one another, and others that they are the same. So we see here in the Disoi Logoi the first distinction between arguments that are true and arguments that are false. And I say, whoever wrote it says this, and I say the following, first, that true and false logos are expressed in the same words. Second, when a logos is spoken, and events have occurred the way the logos is spoken, the logos is true. But if they have not occurred, the same logos is false. So the idea here is we use words, and those words are true if those words represent what occurs in reality. This is what later on philosophers will refer, will refer to as um, uh, the representative, um, I'm sorry, um, the correspondence theory of truth. In order for a word, uh, a logos to be true, it has to correspond with a state of affairs in reality. If that logos has no correspondence, it's false. So that's all that means. Now, suppose it, it accuses someone of sacrilege. If the deed took place, the logos is true, but if it did not take place, it's false. And the logos of the defendant is the same. And the courts judge the same logos to be both false and true. Next, if you if you are if we are seated one next to another and we each say, I am an initiate of the mysteries, we will all say the same thing, but only I will be truthful, since in fact I am the only one who is. Uh, right? And so the argument here is that he's giving another example of the way in which a, a claim can be either true or false. It depends on who really is the initiate, right? Now, it's obvious that the same logos is false whenever falsehood is present to it, and true whenever truth is. In the same way, a person is the same individual as a boy 
and as a youth and as an adult and as an old man. It's also stated that the false logos and the true logos are different from one another, differing in name just as they differ in fact. For if anyone asks those who say that the same logos is both false and true, of which, uh, I'm sorry, which of the two, namely false and true, the logos that they are stating is, then if it is false, clearly they, the true logos and the false logos, are two and therefore not the same. Right? So even though you can have uh, a logos, um, right? So what does that mean? It means that truth and falsehood can appear in the same clothing, right? So if I say, so for instance, if I say I'm recording this video and you right now watching this video say I'm recording this video, we both have the same utterance and yet one of us is being truthful and the other is being false. Um, or one, one claim is false, one claim is true. So truth and falsehood are not based upon the, the words. They're based upon reality, based upon something outside of the words. So you might say that the words, the logos, has to be derivative if it's to be true to reality. Okay. Um, so, and if anyone has ever spoken or bore witness of things that are true, it follows that these same things are false. And if he knows any man to be true, and he knows the same man to be false, as a result of the argument, they say these things because of, if the thing occurred, the logos is true, and if it did not, then it's false. Therefore, it is not their name that differs, but the fact of the matter. So that's the notion. It's the facts that matter. It's not the words. Moreover, if anyone should ask the jurors what they are judging, these people too agree that the logos with which falsehood is mixed is false, and that which with truth is mixed. This is the entire difference. Now, I think this is really sort of an important feature of philosophy, and it's very ancient here. But it's this notion that in when we're talking about what the sophists are doing, the sophists are, are articulating the means for rhetoric, how to make arguments. But you can see here the disoi logoi suggests that Listen, people can give arguments. They can give stronger and weaker arguments. But whether or not something really is the case is not dependent upon the words, but rather upon the facts. Um, and this is a really sort of interesting and important feature related to logic and I think the metaphysics of logic. Okay, let's move to another sophist, Gorgias. Um, um, and Gorgias, he was born around 490 BC and died around, I'm sorry, he was born around 490 BC and he probably lived roughly a hundred or more years and died in the thir 390s. Um, he too was a teacher of rhetoric and he came to Athens actually on a diplomatic mission in 427 BCE. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about Gorgias. He's typically a, a, a well-known, and we're going to see him later. There's a lot of, there's in fact, there's a dialogue, uh, one of Plato's dialogues in which Socrates and Gorgias sort of go at it, um, and so we'll talk more about that when we, we do our video on the Gorgias, um, Plato's Gorgias, but the real Gorgias, um, there's two texts we're going to be taking a look at real briefly here, we're related to his sophistic um, philosophy, if you want to call it that. The first is the defense of Helen of Troy, where he explores the power of persuasion and rhetoric, and the second is on nature, where he explores metaphysics, um, and we'll see that his views are, I think, in, unintelligible, especially in the metaphysics. Uh, but let's start here with his idea, his discussion about Helen. Now, this comes from this comes from the same text, which is also referred to as the praise of Helen. And what is he talking about? He's talking about Helen of Troy. And if you don't recall from, you know, your mythology here, Helen of Troy, at the beginning, uh, the Trojan War began when Helen um, was convinced to go to Troy, and this sparked a huge war, as you know, uh, and if you haven't read it, um, you should read the Iliad, which really gives us all of the information regarding this. And one of the things that Gorgias was trying to do in this text was argue that, is Helen a villain? Because Helen, by Helen's agreement to go to Troy, she basically caused the deaths of thousands, right? So is Helen a villain? And he's gonna argue no. He's gonna argue that Helen, went to Troy as a result of agreeing to a certain type of argument. And this is the power of rhetoric. And he's going to be using this term logos. Well, remember, logos just refers to speech, a way of talking, an argument, right? 
and he, and he says, I'll, I have here sort of some quotes, and I've sort of tried to sort of sum it up together, right? He argues that Logos is a powerful master, right? Language here is maybe what you want to think about. Language convinces us, right? Inspired incantations bring on um, pleasing and they bring away grief through words. So through our words, we can think about this. It's true. When simply through the act of uttering something with someone's tongue, they can bring upon me both pleasure or grief. That's the power that words have. And that's certainly true, right? Words, we always, people always say sticks and stones can't break your bones, but words will, will never hurt me. Well, that's not true. Words do hurt you, right? Um, and so that's the power of rhetoric, is that it can move our emotional dispositions, right? As well as our pleasures and our pains. And he then goes on to say, all who have persuaded or who persuade anyone or anything do so by fashioning a false logos. So this is sort of interesting here. Um, if you're going to persuade someone, you have to create a logos. And because the logos is not related to fact, right, because you're creating it, it's false, right? Therefore, the one who, um, the one who, per, who was persuaded since he... Okay, I accidentally mistyped this, and so my apologies. Therefore, the one who, who was persuaded since he was compelled is unjust. Okay, I think I've mistyped this. But the idea here is that um, Gorgias wants to say that the one who does the persuading is the one who is unjust, right? The one who comes up with the false logos. Whereas, by contrast, the one who was persuaded since she was compelled by logos is wrongly blamed. So the argument here is that Helen was was um, Helen was convinced by a false logos. So Helen isn't the one to be to blame. We shouldn't blame the Trojan War on her, but rather we should just say that she you know she's unfortunate, right? Or in other words, it has been stated that if she was persuaded by logos, she did not do wrong, but she's rather unfortunate. So what is this idea here? It means that one should attend first, or he goes on to say that we should look at the logos of astronomers, of the scientists. We should also look at the logos that comes out in these compulsory competitions in which people give speeches and they debate. And we should also look at the logos in which we see the philosophers giving various contesting accounts. So you can see here that there's sort of three different types of logos that he seems to identify. Those be, I would say as a sort of scientific logos, you might say political logos, and then philosophical logos, um, right? But the sort of key thing here is that the power of persuasion, the responsibility lies with the one who makes the persuasion, the persuader, not the one who gets persuaded. Um, they're just unfortunate. So you can see here, for instance, we actually follow through with this in our own world, right? Think about lies. If someone persuades me to believe a lie, I may go and repeat that lie, but usually in my repeating of the lie, you don't hold me responsible for the lie, though you, I'm an unfortunate part of the whole thing, right? Who do you hold responsible for the lie? The one who comes up with the logos. And that's what he wants to argue. And he has, has a defense of Helen of Troy here, right? Now let's skip here and let's look at his discussion of um, Iliadic metaphysics. And this comes from his discussion of it's what is not, or sometimes it's translated as on nature. Starting with the concept of nothing here. And this is, we're going to see here that Gorgias believed that there was, that the universe is nothing, which I, which is sort of utterly unintelligible. Uh, but you'll see he has an interesting argument for it, if you can follow it. And I've sort of tried to reconstruct it best I can. Uh, if something is, Either what is, is, or what is not, is, or both what is and what is not are. So he sets up an initial dichotomy. And that dichotomy here is a tension between two different things. And the idea here is that, is that there either are things that are real, or there are things that aren't real, or there's both things that are real and are not real, right? Um, but here's the problem. What is not cannot be, right? Because what is not is, by definition, something that doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, then it can't be what is. So we can't say that what is not is, right? This is essentially the same 
discussion that Parmenides has. But we'll see that Gorgias goes further. So in order for what is to be, it must uh, be both eternal and generated at the same time, he argues. So to be eternal, what is cannot have a beginning, right? And by the way, um, eternal makes sense here because if what is is, then it means it is not what is not. If, if what is is not what is not, then what is has to have always been, right? So it has to be eternal. But, and that means that what is cannot have a beginning. But here's the problem. If it doesn't have a beginning, then it's nowhere. If it's nowhere, it's not, right? Uh, so wait a second, because all things that have um, a beginning have a place. Um, if something is eternal, then it has no place. If it has no place, then it can't be a thing. Therefore, it's not the case that anything is, right? Um, okay. Wait, what I, you're going to see here, you're going to have to pause this video and read this really quite slowly to see if you can understand it. Number seven here, what is cannot be generated because if generated, it came from either something else that is or is not, right? So if what is is generated, right, then that means it came from something before. But if it came from something before, it either came from what is or came from what is not. It couldn't have come from what is not because if it was not then it's nothing but it couldn't have come from what is because if it came from what is that is already is thus it can't be a form of generation so is it one or many well if reality is one then it has quantity if it has quantity then it's divisible if it's divisible then it's not one if it's many then it is a numerous set of ones but it is not one, therefore it cannot be many. You can see here, what Gorgias is doing is he's ultimately arguing that when we look at the basics of metaphysics, and we define metaphysics in terms of existence and non-existence, we end up with basically um, utter unintelligibility. <clears throat> the only thing that's not unintelligible is to say that nothing is. To deny both categories, right? And he argues here, that it follows that nothing is, for if neither what is is, nor what is not, nor both, and nothing aside from these is conceived of, nothing is. So his argument is the only thing that we can conceive of, really, is not existence or nothingness. So we just have to conclude that what we think is reality isn't anything, because it doesn't make any sense. And here we could ask a question of, well, what is his commitment to intelligibility? Uh, and so famously, Gorgias argues that uh, there is no such thing as reality, um, which seems on the face of it ludicrous. But on the other hand, his argument will be, well, whatever metaphysical hypothesis you give, if it depends upon these categories of existence and nothingness, it too is unintelligible. Um, and so you might just say, I think probably my conclusion in reading Gorgias here is to say that Ultimately, it just leads to skepticism, to the denial that we can know things. Though he seems to have argued that we can know that nothing is. And I just don't know how to make sense of that, to be honest. So, two more points here. Even if something is, it's unknowable and inconceivable by humans. And so maybe this is how he gets out of the nothingness problems, right? He says, quote, next in order, next in order is to teach that even if something is, it is unknowable and inconceivable by humans. For if things that are thought of, says Gorgias, are not things that are, what is is not thought of, and reasonably so. For just as if things that are thought of have the attribute of being white, being thought of would be an attribute of white things. So if things that are thought of have the attribute of not being things that are, not to be thought of will necessarily be an attribute of things that are. That is why they claim, I'm sorry, that is why the claim that if things that are thought of are not things that are, then what is, is not thought of, is sound and preserves the sequence of argument. But things that are thought of, for we must assume this, are not things that are, as we will show, therefore it's not the case, that what is, is thought of, right? So his argument here is that we can't actually think what is. Uh, again, you can see why he concludes with nothingness. Because nothingness doesn't require explanation, because nothingness is nothing, right? Even if it should be comprehended, even if we can understand reality, it cannot be expressed, right? So he says, 
quote, for that by which we communicate is logos, and here we mean words. We communicate with words, but, but logos, the words, are not the objects, right? The words are not the same thing. That's the um, disoi logoi, remember, is that the words have to match up to things, they have to match up to facts and reality. But you can see here that logos is the way, which we, the way by which we communicate, right? But logos is not the same thing as the objects. So the things that are, right, the objects are the things that are. Therefore, it's not the case that we can communicate things that are to our neighbors, but logos, which is different. Um, so you can see here that there's a difference between reality and language, and that difference supersedes the possibility of actually making metaphysical progress. That is, making progress in terms of knowing what is the case. So again, it has to just result in a form of skepticism. That is a denial of what can be known. I want to end here. I'm a little over time, so I want to go through these guys, last two or three philosophers very quickly. There's not too much to say about them. There's not too much known about them. The first is per, per, um, Prodicus. Prodicus lived around 460 BCE, and some of the Platonic dialogues suggest that he was the teacher of Socrates. Whether or not that's true, we do not know. Um, so I don't think I would go around saying that he was the teacher of Socrates, but it, pro it certainly was the case, probably, that Socrates was interested in Prodicus to some degree. He would, Prodicus was interested, we're told, in rhetoric, logic, ethic, virtues, and the origin of religion. And in particular, he's to have denied the, the reality of the gods. And there's not much to say with regard to Prodicus, except for this, and this is what we'll sort of look at here, is he argues that in reality, contradictions are possible. Um, and that might be a very important point, because if contradictions are possible, then it would mean that what is non-contradictory is possible. And what is non-contradictory, therefore, can map to reality, um, right? Which means that maybe logos, in which contradictions occur, can actually give us access to reality. Um, so this is sort of a, um, contraposed here to Gorgias, right? And here's the example of why he says that contradictions are impossible. Because if two people contradict each other, they are speaking to each other. Right? So imagine if I say I'm the teacher and you say you're the teacher. Right? If we both say that at the same time, we are actually talking to each other. Right? And if we're speaking to each other, then we can't both be speaking with reference to the same fact. Now here you can see he's assuming that when we speak, we're being honest. Right? So if I say I'm the teacher and I'm being honest, and you say you're the teacher and you're being honest, that means that our logos, which has to map to something real, we must be mapping it to different things. So that is, we must have different references, um, reference points to our language. So when I say I'm the teacher, I must mean something different than what you mean. Because if we're being honest, then we can't be talking about the same thing. So although contradictions can appear in language, they can't occur in reality. Because the reference towards which our language maps, that's the way I'm using the language here, our logoi maps to different things, right? Um, and then here's a switch. So you can see here there's a nice continuation here of the impact of the disoi logoi. Um, and also here in terms of the gods, right, we see this idea is that the, um, uh, we're told that Prodicus says that the gods were worshipped by men, neither exist now nor have knowledge, but that the ancients exalted crops and everything else that is useful for life. So what's the idea? He says that the ancients looked at anything that was useful for life and saw within that divinity. And then they created divine gods. And eventually the Hellenistic, um, the Hellenistic uh, um, uh, canon of all of the gods. So the idea here is that theology, right, our sense of religion is ultimately based upon our recognition of nature and what's useful in life. And this seems to be pretty accurate probably in terms of the criticism of ancient Greek religion because ancient Greek religion seems to create gods that are identified with certain aspects of nature. Um, so that is, so he denies the gods, the Greek gods. So the sophists were not all, they didn't always agree with, and they frequently disagreed with people actually. Another um, Greek sophist here is Hippos. Now, we don't know when he was born, though we do know he was alive when Socrates died. So he's another contemporary of Socrates. We know that he was wealthy and he was very successful. In fact, Plato ridicules him as a polymath. You'll recall that 
Also, Pythagoras was ridiculed as a polymath. A polymath is someone who knows a lot, but doesn't have insight. Um, and so Hippus was probably well-educated, but he probably, or at least Plato didn't think that he understood all the, the linkage between all of the different things that he knew. We know that he taught rhetoric, um, mnemonics, math, and geometry. He was also an early historian, um, and um, a number of different, uh, we know that he also is one of the first people to actually record the victors of the Greek, the Greek Olympics. Um, here's sort of two fragments related to Hippus. Some of these things may have been said by Orpheus, some by Mausius in short in different places by different authors, some by Hesiod, Homer, or the other poets, um, works of Greeks or foreigners. From all of them, I, Hippias, have collected the most important ones that are related, and I'll compose out of the out of them this original multiform account. So you can see here Hippus here, or Hippias, if, if you're using a different translation spelling here, his argument was that, or here's his sort of discussion of his history, right? His put, taking together a whole bunch of different accounts from different sources and trying to find in them some, what actually happened. Uh, we also have here this, right? How can anyone suppose that the laws are a serious matter or believe in them, since it also happens that the very people who make them repeal them and substitute and pass others in their place, right? So here you can see here that Hippus suggests that we should be critical of the laws that govern our society because they're contingent. They seem to change. Okay, um, next here is Antiphon. Antiphon was a Sovist who lived circa 480 BCE. Um, he's probably the same Antiphon of Phamenos. Um, um, there's different Antiphons that are referenced in ancient uh, sources, and we believe that Antiphon and Antiphon of Phamenos are probably the same person. And he was a citizen of Athens. Now, one of the things that's interesting here that worth regarding is that uh, Antiphon seems to raise the question of what is the relationship between nature and custom, between fusis, that's where we get the term physics, and nomos, um, which we get the term normativity, right? Custom, what's the norm, um, ultimately? Um, and so we see here uh, this sort of discussion. Well, let me make that a little smaller, right? So he says, for instance, this is the entire purpose considering these matters, that most of the things that are just according to no most, most of the things that are just according to custom, are established in a way that's hostile to fuses. That is, it looks like custom and nature are in tension with each other. For no moi, that is what's natural, have been established for the eyes as to what they must, right? They appear as they are, um, as they must see and what they must not, and for the ears as to what they must hear and what they must not hear, and for the tongue as to what it must say and what it must not, and for the hands as to what they must do and what they must not, and for the feet as to where they must go and where they must not, and for the mind as to what it must desire and what it must not. You can see here that um, so that we create customs to tell us what we should see, what we should hear, what we should understand, where we can go. We use customs to essentially uh, limit what we can do. Now the, but now, now take a look at this. It says, now the things from which the nomoi deter humans are no more in accord with or suited to fusis than the things that they promote. Living and dying are matters of fusis, and living results for them from what is advantageous, dying from what is not advantageous. But the advantageous that are established by the nomoi, by the customs, are bonds on the fusus, and this, those established by fusus are free. So he seems to link up here this idea that our customs play a role in terms of limiting our activities, and uh, fusus, nature, plays the role in providing us the freedom to do things. And so the relationship between the two is actually comprehensible, um, though we should say that our customs are not based upon our nature, right? And we also get this sort of, um, uh, from Sexus Empiricus, also quoting the same sophist here, referring to the same sophist. <coughs> Excuse me, he says, there was a time when human life was without order, on the level of beast and subject to force, when there was no reward for the good or punishment for the bad. <coughs> and then I think humans established nomoi, or punishers, so that justice would be the mightier ruler of all equally, and would have violence as its slave, 
and anyone who did wrong would be punished. So we see here that this idea that cussed, that in nature, everything was permitted, people were totally free to do whatever, and that ultimately this is very problematic, and that customs are established in order to have, a, so that we can have a sense of justice, um, and so, so that we can actually live better lives, actually, and that we punish people who are evil. So for him, and here's an early philosophical suggestion that we should really take seriously. The idea that justice is established through social convention. Justice is not the result of looking through looking at nature. Justice is something that's created against nature. Or, or I shouldn't say against, but um, in, um, in contradistinction to nature. So we get this very early concept here. Uh, a discussion and this these discussions of nature and justice will come up again and again in the later dialogues especially in Plato's Republic okay I'm gonna there's of course other sophists we could talk about and I encourage you to continue and there's other pre-Socratic philosophers we could talk about and I encourage you to continue your own study we're gonna conclude our discussion with um, on pre-Socratic and sophistic philosophy here we will talk about the sophists later in some of the later videos especially about on, on Plato. Um, but this concludes our discussion of the pre-Socratic philosophers. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys online.